Look at all this snow. It's hard to believe that I started this channel in April last year and we were snowed in at that time and now we have snow again. Our little garden is totally snowed under right now, but it's really beautiful in the snow as well. I have to make sure that the little birds have enough water. This week, I want to pick up where the story of the Magi leaves off in Matthew 2, 13. I see this known as Flight into Egypt. And this is an important story because it gets filled out as the Christian tradition goes along. And oftentimes, it's those aspects or elements of our culture or our tradition that shape how we understand and read the biblical text. But I like this particular story because it has a lot of very interesting embellishments and a rich history and art history as well. So let's go in and take a look at the story of the flight into Egypt. Good morning. As I said outside, I'd like to do something a little bit different today. Most of my other videos on biblical passages have really focused upon one particular passage. Today, what I'd like to do is take one passage, but instead of looking at the account of the flight into Egypt in Matthew, what I want to look at is the extra biblical accounts or interpretations that get filled into this story as the church history and tradition progresses. I think it's a fascinating story and has a rich history in artworks as well. So let's dive into this. I hope you have coffee because this is the Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and the goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching in seminary and other institutions for the past 20 plus years and bring it to you on YouTube so that you can read your Bible in a more stimulating and engaged manner. So if you like it, be sure to subscribe, hit the notifications bell, YouTube will let you know when new videos pop up. Also give it a thumbs up if you like it, comments if you have questions. Having gotten all the business out of the way, let's jump into Matthew chapter two, verse 13 forward, the flight into Egypt. Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. After the Magi depart Bethlehem, and remember they are warned by an angel not to go back and tell Herod, now Joseph receives an angelic visitation, and he is warned to take Mary and Jesus and to flee to Egypt until he is called to come back again. Matthew 2, verses 12 through 15. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and its mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose, and he took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. This is one of these passages that generated a great deal of interest within the early church, especially those in Egypt, because here's a story that specifically tells you that Jesus spent time in Egypt. So the church there would have had a great deal of interest within that passage. What happens is that probably for the next four, 500 years or so, the church in Egypt or the Christian community there begins to expand upon this very skeletal story. Notice we're mainly told what the angel says and what Joseph does. We don't have anything about their journey to Egypt. We, don't, we aren't told where they stay or what they do along the route. It leaves a lot of gaps or omissions within the story that allow future readers to sort of fill in. It's a lot like a lot of our hymns or perhaps the plays Godspell or Jesus Christ Superstar or even movies like the Ten Commandments or these various movies on the life of Jesus. They all fill in and develop the stories in various different ways in order to communicate it to their audience. The primary text that does this is a text that is called Pseudo-Matthew. 
Now, there's a number of texts that get written around the New Testament or even the Old Testament. They're referred to either as apocryphal or pseudepigraphal. Apocryphal means, from the Greek apo, around. These are texts that are written sort of around the biblical text, sort of fill it out. And they tend to hew closest to what the biblical texts say. Pseudepigraphal texts, by the other hand, pseudo for false and graphical meaning written, these are texts that often sort of are penned under one of the biblical author's names. So, for example, pseudo-Matthew, that somehow the name of this text got associated with Matthew. Now, it was never accepted to have been written by Matthew, but this text appears to have been written probably somewhere around 5 to 600 A.D. The earliest copies that we have available us today are from around 900 A.D. And I'll leave a link below this video in the show more or the description section with a link to the Pseudo Gospel of Matthew so that you can even read the relevant section for yourself. It's a very fascinating story and you can definitely compare and contrast that with the biblical text here and you'll see just how developed and fanciful the story is. One of the things that really characterizes the biblical stories, especially the Gospels, is how concise they are. For example, in this story with the flight into Egypt, it's only three verses long. And then we have another verse that talks about their return coming back. Four verses about the entire families fleeing down to Egypt and then coming back. By contrast, pseudepigraphal stories pick up on that idea and then develop or fill in those gaps to a much greater degree and often in very fanciful ways. So let's take a look at sort of the three to four pages worth of content that the pseudo gospel of Matthew has on these four verses from Matthew's gospel. And I'm going to concisely summarize it here because it's way too long to read the whole thing. First off, after the family flees Bethlehem, their first night on the road, they take shelter in a cave. And while they're sleeping there, dragons emerge from the depth. And you kind of go, really? I mean, immediately you have to throw dragons into this whole thing? Anyways, we're talking about somebody from around 600 AD writing this story, and we're gonna let him tell it his way. Mary and Joseph are terrified, but Jesus instead speaks to them, and they calm down and they become like domesticated house pets in the presence of Jesus. On the third day, the family runs out of food and water. Mary sees a palm tree and asks if they can't rest under it for a bit. While they're resting under this palm tree, Mary asks if Joseph can't get her some fruit from the tree. But they're too high up, he's not able to get them. So Jesus speaks to the palm tree and the palm tree bends down so that Joseph can pick the fruit and then give it to Mary. Then in regard to water, he speaks to the palm tree and it kind of rises up out of the ground, it opens its roots, and a stream or a spring of water comes out from its roots. Oftentimes in the artwork, you'll see this palm tree within the picture there that's alluding to this particular aspect out of the Pseudo Gospel of Matthew. When they reach Egypt, the first city that they stay in is Sotanin in Egypt. And once again, like Bethlehem, they're not able to find a room to stay in. So they take shelter in a temple. At night while they're sleeping, 365 idols in the temple fall to the ground and shatter. Around 900 to 1000 AD, another event gets added to the story. And that is, on the first day when the Holy Family fled Herod, they passed by a farmer who was planting crops in his field. And they asked him to tell any soldiers who might be pursuing them that they passed by when he was planting the crop in his field. That night, his entire crop grew to maturity. The next day, soldiers come and ask the farmer if he had seen Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. He tells them that yes, he did, and they passed by when he was planting his crop. The soldiers look at the field, see that the crop is in full maturity, and they realize that the Holy Family has been by maybe three to six months before them, and they've lost the chase. Now, this is interesting because A, it provides a means of escape for the Holy Family. B, they ask the farmer to tell the truth. And C, the miracle provides the means for the farmer to tell the truth without lying, something that was very important in the ethics of the early church. I said I wanted to show you how this was interpreted, particularly within artwork. And the first images I want to show you are taken from what's called the Speculum Humanae Salvationonis. 
And this was a type of text, they were sort of like study Bibles, that were used within churches to train people in the basics of their faith. Oftentimes, they included illuminations or images within the text, and it was the wealth of that particular church or the patrons within that church that really determined how well and how vividly these texts were illustrated. So the first one I have here is a black and white image. This one stays fairly close to the biblical account. The image on the left shows Mary, Jesus, and then we actually get Joseph's name above him in the image there. And then on the right-hand side, it talks about that they are in Egypt in Sotin. And so you have a depiction of Mary and Jesus within this temple. You don't have the idols falling down in this particular story. The second one, the depiction of the flay into Egypt on the top, with various prophets from the Old Testament around the side making comments upon the flight into Egypt. And then we actually have sort of the expansion or the commentary upon this text below this image. Notice how this one on the left has that pillar with this, what looks like a demon on the top. This was a medieval depiction of an idol. Here in this picture, we have the conflation of the flight, the actual journey into Egypt with the idols falling from their temple. And this is developed a little bit more in the close-up I have from another speculum here, where we actually have the idol up there on that sort of pedestal, but notice this time it's broken in half. Now these copies of the speculum Humane Salvationis that I have here are really from around 1300. There are earlier copies, but they don't have nearly the illuminations on this particular story that I was looking for. In the Cathedral of Notre Dame, we have this beautiful stained glass window from probably around the 12th to 13th century that shows Mary, Jesus, and Joseph on their flight to Egypt. This one isn't embellished. It sticks very, very close to the biblical account, but as we're going to be seeing, this gets developed in other artwork as time goes along. We also have text from the late medieval period from very, very rich sort of patrons or dukes and these were sort of like the treasures of the particular household. This particular one, this book of ours, is a copy that was made of one that was for Jean-Luc de Berry, the Duke of Berry. And in this, on the flight to Egypt, we have this beautifully illustrated illumination here. Now notice in this image here, we have the palm tree bending down to feed the Holy Family. We have sort of matrons or people that were said to accompany the family on the journey. And then down at the very bottom there, you see the soldiers approaching the farmer and he's turning around addressing the soldiers and telling them that the family passed by when this was planted. So you can see how this story gets picked up and developed through church history. In Gosen van der Weyden's 1516 depiction of this, we see Mary upon the donkey but notice that Joseph is in the front and he is looking back at Israel. But you see the farmer with his field of wheat down there in the distant foreground. Also to the right of Mary, you have this pedestal with the idol that has fallen off it. Now Joaquin Patinar in the 1500s really liked this story a lot and he did several images on it. But this particular one here, I think, really shows a lot of the elements in the story. We have Mary and Jesus resting. Joseph is off to the side seeking food. And then we have the soldiers talking to the farmer in sort of the middle right background there. You can see how he picks up elements from the pseudo gospel of Matthew and then incorporates them into this picture. And these images are sort of like comic books, only instead of having individual frames, they have different parts of the image that are telling you or communicating different aspects of the story to you. The second one from Joaquin Patiner here from 1515, Landscape with the Flight into Egypt, really conveys this idea of the fear or the danger that the family is in. Notice how they're in this very dark landscape and they are all by themselves. The city and everything else is distant from them. This gets picked up by Rembrandt in the next image here, where we see the Holy Family camping down by what looks like a stream or a riverside with a fire. And in the background, we can just barely see houses. In other words, the way he depicts it here is that the family is purposely avoiding contact with other people during this flight. 
One particularly dramatic depiction here is by Tintoretto. If you notice on the far right hand side, you have the palm tree. It seems to be out of place with all the other deciduous trees in the picture, but it's alluding to the story of Jesus commanding the palm tree to bend down. And then you have the family. The way they're depicted is almost if they are coming out of the picture or over the frame into the real world. It creates a very dramatic or dynamic sense of movement within the image. If we move on a little bit further, we have this picture by Gentileschi, Rest on the Flight to Egypt. And this really develops a very common theme that we see in a lot of them with Mary and Jesus up, Mary usually nursing Jesus, but Joseph is sound asleep from the journey. Oftentimes you'll have their beast of burden or their donkey in the background of the image. In contrast to that, Michelangelo Caraggio, when he depicted the flight into Egypt, he really takes and he sort of spiritualizes it. This one's unique in that Mary is asleep with the baby. The music Joseph is holding up for the angel to play is from the Song of Solomon 7, 6 through 7. How beautiful are you, my beloved, you are a creature of bliss as you stand there like a palm tree and your breasts like the grapes. And this really picks up these ideas of Mary's youth and her beauty, but also the palm tree that bends down. Mary and Joseph are on different sides of the image, split down the middle by the angel. We have old age and masculinity on the left, and we have youth and femininity on the right. But it also depicts work and rest, light and dark, awake and asleep. There's a lot that's been being communicated within this image. Coming down a little bit closer to the present, in 1860, Luke Oliver Mersan did his depiction on rest on the flight to Egypt. And definitely we're in Egypt now. We have the desert and we have the Sphinx there in the background with Joseph sleeping in the foreground. Mary and Jesus are sleeping in sort of the lap of the Sphinx there, which then once again creates echoes or resonances with the story of them sleeping within the temple at Sotin. But it's a, just a really, really amazing piece of artwork in my opinion. Final one that comes down, even though it's not directly entitled Rest on the Flight to Egypt, is Picasso's depiction of poverty or a blind man and his family. In this image, we have a man with his wife and then their young child. Picasso's image here really evokes a lot of the images that come out of these depictions of the flight into Egypt. I think Picasso's image really brings out an important point for us, is that when Joseph takes Mary and Jesus and they flee to Egypt, they're refugees. And so often today, refugees or asylum seekers are persecuted or denied rights because we see them as invading or trying to take advantage of our country. And this is not unique to the United States. This is something around the world. The church, I think, should stand up to this because here we have the very family and Jesus in his infancy seeking asylum or refuge in Egypt. This is a problem that is around the world and has been with us since the biblical time. The Christian tradition of interpreting the biblical text is one where we have actual comments upon the biblical text, but then we also have this extra biblical literature that gets added or artwork that's get added to the tradition. In this particular case, these extra biblical texts like the pseudo gospel of Matthew get added to the Christian tradition. They are not part of the biblical text, but they were used at various points in time throughout the Christian church to fill in or expand what they thought were sort of gaps or stories that were too brief. We look at them today and we might think, oh, that really seems pretty fanciful or various things like this. But you need to realize that the people during that time really read these with a great deal of seriousness and it contributed to their spiritual growth and devotion towards Christ. They do help us to see and understand this tradition that we stand within and the rich diversity that is within it. If you enjoyed this video on the history of the interpretation on the flight into Egypt, please be sure to subscribe. Until next week, I shall leave you with the word of peace.